Good afternoon, everybody. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Yam Yam Retro Gaming. Um, I'm kind of taking the piss. I'm not feeling too good today. I've got a bad problem with my leg at the moment, and it's giving me serious problems standing on my foot. So I'm just kind of taking the afternoon off work, so I thought I'd do a live stream and cover something that a lot of you want to hear about. And, you know, I like to cover because it's a great project. And in response to you all moaning about my shaky hand, that can't be helped. So um, even though it's not suitable for all occasions, I have got my gimbal hooked up today. So at least you should go slightly steadier video while I'm shaking around. And uh, or even though I've got to hold it kind of side on for the sake of this filming. So I might not be able to see your comments until after I'm done. Um, but yeah, anyway, um, I'm going to be covering the Spectrum next. As a lot of you know, the Spectrum Next is now not far from coming out. For any of you who've backed it, I hope you're getting as excited as I am. I've had the full accelerated one with all the trimmings and a laser etch name on it, which should be quite cool. And so is my brother. So uh, hopefully when they come, you know, we'll be able to fully get to grips with the full system as it was intended and conceived by Rick Dickinson. And, um, you know, we'll get to play the Next the way it was meant to be. But until then, um, thankfully, uh, not long ago, I picked up my own Spectrum Next from a friend, Zeb, um, who kindly let me have his uh, 48K cased version of the Next, which I'm going to switch to now. Which is there. Uh, you can see uh, he's taken the uh, Next board and cased it in an original rubber keyed zx 48 you have to excuse me i'm just still getting to grips with this gimbal um trying to get used to turning it smoothly i should have probably disabled face tracking because it's trying to track whatever's in focus even though i'm trying to snatch it around and turn it um so yeah you can see that the the actual board has been housed inside there the original rubber key uh rubber, rubber keyboard has been uh, been used for it um, going around the side, if I can kind of turn it round that way, you can see the ports on the side there. We've got the uh, the reset, the drive, and the M button around the side. Not sure why it's jumping about like that. Sorry about that. As well as the SD card slot. Going around the back. You can see there the uh, HDMI port, the mic and ear ports, which are in the respective places they originally were, the original interface port, the 9 volt power port, and the VGA port, and the PS2 port there for the keyboard and mouse. I've got it hooked up by HDMI at the moment, um, purely because it's the best way to get sound through. Obviously, doing it through VGA, you've got to rely on an internal speaker or something else um, to output your sound, so I'm not going to be doing that. <coughs> we did it through HDMI the way it's intended to be. Uh, and as you can see, unlike the production next, which will have the ports on the right hand side, uh, sorry, the left hand side, uh, because of the way the internals are on this, uh, Zeb has actually added the joystick ports to the right hand side, so it will fit inside this case. Uh, until we get the full version, this will have to do. And you know what? It works perfectly. And for anybody who wants to be more nostalgic and wants to do this, this is a perfectly acceptable way to play next. And I have been doing now for about four months, I think, on this. And I'm very happy with it. I've got my trusty uh, Quickshot 2 Turbo joystick there, Kempston joystick. I've got my uh, first next games from Adrian Cummings. You can see there I've got Dungeonette and Delta Star Earth Defense. Um, I don't actually need to use those because I've actually copied the files over onto the, the SD card. Uh, but I've just brought them out just to show you anyway. And uh, rather sensibly for this, I've bought a proper nine volt power supply. Um, and even though they, they really should have done it, I wish they had have done, but they didn't consider problems we have in the UK with surges and things like that. Um, it really should have had a physical power switch because it, it's just nonsensical to me these days that 
you know, um, modern devices don't have a physical insulated on off switch available at your fingertips on the device itself. So what I did, there's a site online you can go to and he's built the, he's built these using uh, components himself uh, with the correct connector on the end for the spectrum. Uh, and it's just basically an inline power switch. And I recommend if, you, if you're gonna be running a Next in the UK, um, it won't have a physical power switch. So you're either gonna to have to add one yourself mess about at the wall, risk plugging it in and out, which nobody in the UK should be doing, um, and uh, get one of these, and at least that way you can just turn it on and off at a, at a pinch like that. How you doing, Derek? You all right? So we're gonna fire up my next anyway. I've got a, I think it's a four gigabyte SD card in here. You don't really need much bigger. We're gonna fire up the next, and we're gonna test some games today. Um, we're going to be testing some games in the accelerated modes. Obviously the Spectrum Next will run original Spectrum games in its native 3.5 megahertz, uh, or you can have them in 7 megahertz or 14 megahertz. Now for those games which are a little bit more advanced and the Spectrum really struggled with back in the day, or ones that were pretty good, but probably could have done with a little bit more grunt to play uh, at, a, at a playable speed, you know, close to arcade speeds, those extra accelerated speeds make a world of difference. Uh, it does make some games unplayable, sadly, and it does mean make some games uh, time incorrectly. So you end up with like super fast music, or they just won't load at all, um, sadly. But um, for a lot of games, it will allow you to play them at a more playable speed. I found that running quite a lot of them at seven megahertz makes them a lot smoother. You know the way they should be. I, I, well, the way I think they should should feel, if you know what I mean. So, I've showed you some next games before. I've showed you Dungeonette and I've showed you Delta Star Earth Defense. I'll touch on them again for anybody who hasn't seen them. But uh, I just wanted to show you where we're up to. The next itself is nearly done, like I say. I have updated the firmware on this to the latest build from the next site. And the next OS to the latest version there, which is 1.99G. Um, they've renamed it from Next OS to Next ZX OS for some reason. Not quite sure. How's it going, Tony? You all right, mate? <laughs> Not working tonight then. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, that, they've added a few new cool tricks. Apparently, they've added mouse support properly to it now. So you can use the mouse, which will be cool for games that are possibly coming up, like. Um, you know, things like, and I know Lemmings is unofficially being kind of ported as a, a kind of a tech demo for it, but it would be cool to see some games, yeah, you know, using a mouse on this. Um, they've added a, quite a few new things into the browser. I've got to be honest, the picture seems a lot more stable since the update. It seems to be compatible with more TVs. The, the menu seems to load faster and operate a lot smoother. They've changed the title of some of the things on there. You've now got Next Basic and Command Line uh, in place of something that was there before. But you've still got the same options on boot up. You can still change it for 50, 60 hertz mode and do a load of other things. They're supposed to have added a five megahertz mode to the speed options from what I gather, but I, I'm not getting that for some reason. Whether that was a, an option or whether you have to do it manually, I'm not sure. But anyway, um, we're all hooked up. We've got um, my Kempston joystick set up. I've put myself a makeshift phone holder down there to record while I'm actually playing the games. Although with this being joystick based, I should be able to hold the gimbal in my left hand and, and kind of record the gameplay while I play on my right hand. Um, screensaver kicked in there, sorry. <laughs> but I'm gonna fire up a couple of my, you know, my remembered games from back in the day and just show you what they look like in accelerated speeds. Um, might copy this video onto the Spectrum Next group if anyone's interested in just seeing, you know, people are kind of getting, getting itchy now, they want to see some real Next grunt, you know, and they're seeing teasers from upcoming games and things like that. But I just thought I'll give a kind of gorilla feel, hands-on feel with a fully working Next, you know, it's not in the new case, obviously, just to show people, you know, what it's like to kind of sit and mess with casually. So I'm going to transfer this to my left hand, or attempt to. Try and bring the screen into focus and keep it stable. Then I'm going to position my joystick where it's comfortable. And we'll 
we'll jump onto the menu now and we're going to browser. Now, like I say, I've already loaded up my system with several, you know, a couple of hundred original Spectrum titles, as well as the Spectrum Next titles. If I go down to games, you have to excuse me, the, the rubber keyboard's still a little bit iffy on this one, so occasionally it doesn't press properly. Another reason I don't want to game on this keyboard, I always hated gaming on a keyboard anyway. Uh, I'll just quickly show you the, the next folder. Now the next folder, uh, I've added in the, the new demos that they've put in and they've added in as part of the ZXOS package. Um, you can see Spectrum Interlude, obviously that was just a Spectrum game back in the day. Benji, shut up. Uh, Nextapede, I, th I don't think has been updated. Sanction, I think, hasn't been updated. Uh, Nextoid now has, has added Kempston joystick support, as far as I'm aware. So it'd be nice to give that a try. Um, Orb, I'm not sure what that is. Is that a demo or is it a next game? I'm not sure, but that's been, that's been added in. Uh, Dreamworld Pogi is finally on the list um, from the off. Benji! Uh, Spectron 2084 and Warhawk, an updated version of Warhawk. I think there's still some more playable levels on there now. Now, if you're wondering what the bark is, by the way, my little chihuahua doesn't like strangers, and even though we tell people not to push shit through our doors, they're constantly doing it, and they linger at the end of our drive, being nosy bastards. So, yeah, he's right to bark at them. And we've got Dark Star there at the bottom, so... Anyway, um, I won't show you any of those just yet. So today, the, the aim is to show you some, you know, original Spectrum games in the enhanced speeds. And I've already made a mistake because what I should have done is change the speed from the title screen, which I didn't, didn't do. So I'm going to quickly reset it. There we go. And from here, if you press left or right on the cursor keys, you can switch to the uh, different speeds. There we go. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, in fact, I'll show you a game in three and a half megahertz first and then show you the difference by stepping it up. <laughs> exactly so in here. So we're going to start with, let's have a look at a typical game. Um, just I'm, I'm, I'm winging this as I go along, by the way. So when something catches my eye, I'm just going to call it up and show you how it looks and then I'll show you again in 7 megahertz and show you what the difference is in playing it. Let's start with uh, a good schmup, there we go, 1942, let's start with that, assuming it loads, it should load. Not all of these are working, I need to check them all, but there we go, we've got 1942. Set up for Kempston, um, so we've got Kempston and we just press 4 to start a one player game. I think. There we go. I'll turn the volume up a touch in a second. And for some reason we're not working. Am I in the wrong port? I think I might have the joystick in the wrong port here. Let's just double check, shall we? I think Kemp's second port might be for Kempston, so I'll we'll just switch that over. can check the assignments on startup really but in fact that's exactly what I'll do I'll just double check I've got this, the options correct All right so I've got joystick one set as Kempston one and joystick two set as MD one. It could be that because there's there's new options here for they've added um, Mega Drive joypad support and they've added um, six button support. I think you know nothing utilised that just yet. So oh, let's get this right. So if I press no, how do I alter it? No oh, space. Let's try that as Kempston 2. And I'll set this one as Kempston 1 just to be sure. We'll work out what's what, what in a minute. Press enter. 
press enter again. Let's see, this should load up just fine. Really shouldn't have the screen in power save mode, but there we go. I need to adjust the options on it, but right. Right, so let's try that again. So apologize for any shakiness. Doing this on my left hand and my left hand doesn't work too well. Uh, let's try this again. Go to 1942. Set up for Kempston. I'm in the second port. Let's see what happens. There we go, it's working there. So this is in three and a half megahertz mode. This is a standard mode. And you know, 1942 is not a bad game, it's a decent conversion, even if the background is a little bit boring. <laughs> um, but you can see, you know, the jitteriness in the, in the animation because obviously the Spectrum didn't have hardware sprites and that caused problems with, it has to redraw the entire screen or at least with some trickery, a portion of the screen each time it, um, each time it redraws any frame of animation has to draw the entire screen. So, you know, it results in slightly jerky not super smooth games and it also limits the amount of action you can have on there. Um, I'm going to have to turn the volume up on this because obviously this is quite a clicky joystick. Oh, give me a second. There we go. <clears throat> so yeah, this is the game in... Um, there we go, I'll put auto fire on so it should be a bit less clicky at least. This is the game in standard three and a half megahertz mode. Cool little game, I do remember it. I think we had a copy of it. We didn't have many original games, we couldn't afford them, so we were always copying them by my own admission back in the day. Uh, how's it going, Lee? You all right, mate? So that's three and a half megahertz mode. So if I quickly reset that, turn auto fire off. And if I switch this now up to 7 megahertz mode, you can see it's just changed there on the top row. And we'll fire the same game back up. If my keyboard works okay, let's get in there. You have to hit it kind of dead center on the key, else it doesn't work. Um, and then we go down to 720. Oh, sorry, 1942, and we load that up. You should immediately notice that the rolling any the rolling colours in the scores there is a lot faster. The way it's flashing at the top is a lot faster. And if I start the game, you should see a noticeable difference. There's no music on this, which is good because it means that can't be affected. But obviously, the actual animation and everything should all be a lot faster. Be a lot more akin to the arcade speeds. So there you go. You can see in in seven megahertz mode, everything just moves at a pace that relies on a, a lot more, you know, a lot better kind of hand-eye coordination. It's not unplayable at these speeds. I'm just playing a bit crap because I'm not used to it, and I'm trying to kind of film and play at the same time. But yeah, I'd turn into 7 megahertz mode will make a lot more games a lot more playable. So I'm just trying to go down the list and see what else is uh, is available. If I try and relaunch this in 14 megahertz, which I'll do now, it will either not load, oh, it may not load, it may just like, just play terror, you know, it's be completely unplayable. So let's just give it a try and I'll show you what's what. And so give me a second, let's go quickly let my dog out as well. Let's launch this up and then I'll open the door and then I'll be right back in two seconds. On it. There you go. Oh boy. <clears throat> right, so yes. Yeah. So I'm back. Now, the, the colour scrolling on there is at ridiculous hyper speed now. 
and it'll probably render this game completely unplayable when I start it, so let's find out. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you can see the speed difference. I mean, it's awesome to, to look at to see a Spectrum game moving at that speed outside of an emulator, but, I mean, come on. You need ridiculous reaction times to be able to deal with that. I'm amazed it loaded at all. A lot of games won't even load in 14 megahertz mode. But this one does, thankfully, so I'm able to show you, but that is just ridiculous speed. One more time. I mean, I, I can't even last more than a few seconds, look. Ridiculous speed. Dodging bullets, for, I mean, dodging planes is bad enough, but dodging bullets, forget about it. Oof. I'll be dead in a second. Look at, the, look at the speed of that. If you love your cave shooters, you might get a kick out of this. <laughs> but, yeah, not for me. So, that's what Accelerated 1942 looks like. So, a lot of people have kind of asked the question then, what's the point of this accelerated mode? Well, I mean, the, the newer games are going to use the faster speeds probably to achieve cooler things than the old Spectrum ever could, but obviously you've got hardware sprites and everything on the next now, and the, the quality of the games, type of games, are going to be coming out. You're not going to care what speed it's at. It's going to be fully playable. You know, it's going to be like the 16-bit computers kind of used to be anyway. <coughs> pretty much town here so um, right so let's go to another game again we'll start it in three and a half megahertz and then we'll switch to uh, seven megahertz and 14 megahertz to show you the difference let's try and turn my gimbal slightly so I can see it um, let's go down if anybody's got any games they want me to, to show you Give me a shout and I will I will try and call it up. So if there's a game you want to see, to see what the difference is, let me know and I'll I'll see if I've got it on my list. If I have, I'll load it up. Um, let's go down. Uh, let's go across. I can read. I think that crashes, so I'm not going to try that. Back to school, Batman. Bomb Jack. Bomb Jack's a favourite of mine, so I'm, I'm just going to quickly show you that and show you what the, the speed difference is like. I mean, Bomb Jack was a perfectly playable game at 3.5 MHz, so you'll see kind of how the faster speeds kind of wreck it, if you know what I mean. Uh, it, it kind of breaks the game. So, 3.5 MHz. Bomb Jack. It's in Kempston mode. Uh, oh, hang on. P for Kempston. There we go. And off we go. This was a favourite of my brother's, a favourite of mine. It's an excellent port, one of the best home ports easily in this game. Bomb Jack in standard three and a half megahertz mode. <clears throat> very animated game, runs very well. I start speeding this up, it kind of renders it unplayable. Even at seven megahertz, it's a struggle. Go across. wobbly table here it doesn't help <laughs> so this is in 7 megahertz mode you can already see the animations on the uh, high score screen a lot faster into chemistry mode and off we go 
Okay, it's not too bad in 7 megahertz mode. It's actually more akin to the arcade speed again, like I was kind of describing, but would make it very hard to kind of play for long. And obviously the pitch of the music sound effects is higher, which is slightly annoying. At least I got the entire sparking bonus that time. And again, we'll reset that and we'll try it in the full 14 megahertz mode. I mean, they're talking about adding a 20, 28 megahertz mode for certain games and you can imagine how crazy that's gonna be. <clears throat> but I'll show you the kind of games where it's going to make a difference shortly. Um, I did do a brief video from the Southwest Amiga Group meet a few weeks ago. I don't know if anybody saw that, but I'm, I'm gonna do it again just to show you um, exactly what kind of difference it can make on the right games. <clears throat> So, right, so it has loaded, which I'm surprised. But the animations now are just ridiculously fast. And it might render it a bit too fast to play. Ah, maybe the way this is programmed is slightly different because it's not actually speeding up the gameplay. I mean, I don't know the internet's programming, I don't know how it works, but the actual gameplay speed seems about the same it just seems a lot smoother and obviously the pitch of the sound effects has gone up quite a bit but yeah on those screens it's just ridiculously fast of how the collision detection works on this game. It does make it a bit easier to play. <laughs> See if I can get those sparking bombs. So the kind of games where it's going to make a big difference are games that, uh, I mean, the, the Spectrum is pretty good at doing kind of vector style, it's what well, it wasn't actually vector, but you know, line style 3D graphics. Now, I know games like Elite are the best way to show this off. For some reason, all the builds I've got of Elite on here either won't load or won't start, and I'm not quite sure why. They're probably bad dumps, to be honest, but... Um, I will show you one game which I showed at the Southwest Amiga group a few weeks ago. Might have been a couple of months ago now. Um, but the difference is obvious in standard speed and accelerated speed. It's a game a lot of you are familiar with. Um, it's a game some of you might like, some of you might absolutely hate. But I used to play it quite a lot on the Atari ST and the Amiga. It got a port to just about every home system back in the day. And if I just find it, it's Stun Car Racer. So the video I posted a few weeks ago wasn't great. This one's better. Now obviously it's the 1 to 8K version. Um, it might have been 1 to 8K only this game, I'm not sure. I know Dave, yeah, I'm hoping to get along if I can, if I'm not eventing. And yeah, we're going to Kempston Joyce. Now this is standard... Bear in mind, this is standard three and a half megahertz speed. Uh, yes, I know I'm I'm immature. So this is this the first track in standard three and a half megahertz mode, and you know. I mean, okay, it was nice to see these kind of graphics back in the day. Not really colourful on the spectrum, obviously. But, you know, it's a passable game. But the, the speed is, it's clunky. It's like watching a slideshow. I mean, I've not even started yet. 
and when I do you'll see that you know the speeds it gets up to aren't fantastic I mean it's, it's barely kind of chundering along even when I go up to full speed you know the animation is is poor let's face it and as, as, uh, once you start crashing or bouncing around corners it renders it I mean difficult to control difficult to follow what's going on you know it makes it pretty much an unplayable game now I'm going to bypass 7 megahertz and I'm going to go straight to 14 megahertz for this <laughs> I don't know, the, the Amiga version was pretty good, Dave. You know, I was, I was, I was a big fan of the... Well, I used to play it on the ST, ad admittedly, because uh, I had access to an ST. I didn't have access to many people's Amigas back in the day. But I did play it on the Amiga, and I've played it in recent years, and, yeah, it's a, it's a good port. But, uh, obviously, this will never have the colours that the, uh, the more advanced computers had. But... It can certainly match the speed. In fact, it can improve on the speed. If I just find it again and show you that same game, 14 megahertz. And I think you'll see a big difference. Fast. Start the racing season, and you'll see a massive difference. Draw to track so much faster, and it now moves at a much more playable speed. And with no music or anything to kind of get in the way, it's not going to be affected by the speed increase. So, and I'll just turbo it up, and you can see it getting to speed a lot faster when I start hitting the bends and that. It just becomes a lot more playable game that seems to respond to your movements a lot better. You know, it feels like a fast racing game. I couldn't even get to the, the first bend just when I was playing the slower mode, but out of the first big hump, that's going to hurt. Ouch! <laughs> but yeah, a much smoother experience. It's drawing the screen a lot faster. And you know, this reminds me now of playing the Amiga version. You know, it's probably a little bit faster than the Amiga version, even if it is less colorful. Ooh. Now I'm aware of a lot of games for the uh, Spectrum that were kind of using this graphical style. They're not games I used to play a lot. I mean, even Elite, I didn't play a lot. I was only very young in my Spectrum playing days and Elite was a bit too advanced for me. Ooh, but, you know, it will make games like Elite draw a lot faster, feel a lot faster. And I think another one that, that has been discussed a lot is Driller. Is it Driller? Which is like, um, it, it's some kind of like maze, well, not maze crawler, but um, polygonal world cr crawler for, for certain. Let's see if I've got it on my list here. I'm not sure if I have, but I'll, if, if I have, I can show it you in uh, standard three and a half megahertz mode, and then I'll show it again in um, 40 megahertz mode. They were talking about adding a 28 megahertz mode just for that game. So let's see if I've got it on my list. Fingers crossed I have, because this is was downloaded in bulk. Oh, I've got a drone now. Doesn't look like I have. I've got a Dragon Ninja there, and then it goes to Dundarek. So. It doesn't look like I have got that game, sadly. Um, I'm just trying to think of any other games. If anybody knows of a, a game that might benefit a lot from being speeded up in this way, just shout it out on the chat and I'll um, I'll call it up. Oh, shut up. Um, but let's uh, take a look at another couple of games and see what difference it makes to them. Well, let's go with uh, let's go with Kickstart. I saw that just um, Kickstart two. There we go. Start again. Starting it in three and a half megahertz mode. Great little game. The course design. It was so much fun on this back in the day. Um, so how do I change joystick?
Then run on Alex Corsis players one. Okay. Select other options by cursor keys left and right. And then press enter to complete. All oh, right, that's the courses I know. I'm gonna go back. Uh, one player. Okay, so off we go, I guess. Well, it must be set for keyboard at the moment, but anyway, that's that's uh, three and a half megahertz. That, Michael, is the $64,000 question. Um, I'm going to be posting this in the Spectrum Next group. I'll probably be corrected on it anyway. But the next, see, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, that they announced it would only ever be a limited run, right? Now, the Kickstarter was one of the most successful things ever. It pissed all over the Vega, and let's not even get into the whole Vega Plus story. But um, it pissed all over projects similar to it, which are creating new hardware and new computers. This has got some, you know, this has got some credibility. You know, it's it's a serious system that's being made. I mean, the board was already proven when they started the Kickstarter. The final complete thing looks so professional, so well done. Even the box. I mean, it's gonna it's gonna pale a comparison to to my Spectrum Next box that I've got at the moment. Which is this. That's my box from my Spectrum Next. But I've seen the designs by Mike. Um, you know, the system is looking fantastic as it as it as it stands today. And you know, pretty soon they're just finalising the keyboard details, I think now. And once that's done, you know, it's going to be awesome. Um But yeah, the final system's looking awesome. It's gotta go, I think is it four thousand or something next are being produced. Um for the people on the Kickstarter who ordered extra boards or complete systems. And you know, it would it wouldn't make sense to create a system and go to this level of design to create a system with a finite span, you know, because it'll limit the amount of support you can give it if there's problems, it'll make it too niche just for hobbyists. And the the level of care that's gone into it, okay, it needs some refining to make it a bit more user-friendly for Joe Public, you know, um, but they're, they're kind of nearly there and the final revision of the software should make it a lot more user friendly, there'll be a lot less to set up and it, it can be a full production thing and it wouldn't make sense to have gone to this level, <clears throat> you know, they raised three quarters of a million pounds, you know, and it's taken three full, three full years of development, I think, um, and had so many, so much input from so many people and he's been taken so seriously, you know, if you want people to make games for this thing, you, you're going to want it out there. So there's a possibility of some people making them and then maybe making a profit on that, a few of those games. And it wouldn't make sense to me for them to not release it to the public. So, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, I th they're, they're probably just being silent about it because they're trying to be a bit humble, I think. Um, but it would make no sense at all. And, you know... Some people might think, oh, well, I want to keep myself elite by having one of these systems. Well, no. You know, being part of the Vega Plus Owners Club is elite. And we all know how shit that is. So, you know, when it comes to, you know, keeping it exclusive, I think that's stupid. Make it more widely produced. Make it so people can get replacement boards. Make it so more people can access it. I could realistically see the Spectrum Next as being a system. I'm just going to switch this back to me for a second. I could realistically see the Spectrum Next as being a system like Chloe Sinclair originally intended the the Spectrum to be. You know, a serious, you know, education tool, a serious learning tool, a way for people to learn coding. You know, just because it's not relevant in the bigger picture of things as far as commercial games go, doesn't mean it's not relevant in the in the picture of things when it comes to uh, coding and learning, you know, base code. Discussing it with some of my programmer friends, you know, the next. It, well, I'll just some more, just discussing the whole subject with some of my programmer friends. They they've basically said that the fundamentals are lost. People who are there's more people than ever learning things like game design, and you know, learning graphics and graphical design and stuff in college, right, for computers. 
But the thing is, they're working with pre-made tools. They're using pre-made engines and things like that. So they're not learning the fundamentals of game design. They're not learning the fundamentals of coding. And, you know, I suppose it's like... It's like learning to drive, trying, trying to learn to drive a race car before you've learned how to drive, you know. Yeah, you might be able to peg it around at ridiculous speeds and kind of pass it off, but could you really, you know, handle it as well as you should do? You know, how's it going, Bill? You're right. And I think that the Spectrum Next has got a very real chance of being used as a development tool um, to create, you know, passable games. I mean, we, we play retro-inspired games, things that are funded on Kickstarter all the time, and, you know, that are using these kind of pixel-drawn graphics, and I don't see why the Spectrum Next couldn't be a system that could realistically be used at computer clubs, could be used for, for tutoring and teaching people base code, you know. And I think if they were to make it mass production and push that kind of market, there's a very real... I think it could be used as a system, given its heritage, um, to be a system that could be taken seriously um, and be, OK, not mainstream... Well, not mainstream, but certainly recognised and used as a tool that could teach people the basics of coding, the basics of game design and, and general software design you know, as well as get people back into the kind of hobbyist thing without the complexities of more established, you know, modern, you know, modern systems. You know, you're going back to basics with something like this. And I think the next could be used that way. And I think it would be, it, it's a no-brainer. It would, it would be nonsensical not to mass produce this thing after the first run is done. And I, I think secretly this is why the production of the next is taking as long as it is, because... If you get everything right, you get it all, you know, C approved and all that, all that business. Now, if it's received well by the backers and received well by casual gamers, it will be more widely adopted. And if that it's more widely adopted and it's got that reputation, more people want to buy it and see what it's all about. More people will make games for it, further increasing its appeal. Um, and you know, the, then then its possibilities of pushing it and marketing it to different kind of audiences is a very real thing and I think that you know I could see it being used in that way people like you know Jim I on here now Jim Bagley he's a big supporter of this thing because of what it represents I think it represents how he started you know you know the kind of environment he started in a lot of people a lot of the coders who are making games for this now as a, as a hobby and just kind of testing it out, you know, even who aren't doing it commercial, it'd be nice to see them get um, a platform to kind of call their own. Um, and, you know, the Spectrum was the system that made people accept home computers back in the day. OK, we only ever used a game on them, we were never taken seriously as business systems or whatever they were supposed to be viewed as, but it was taken as a serious computer, you know, and I think that the heritage behind this... Um, they've kind of got passive blessing on the whole Sinclair thing and it, it certainly represents the way a Spectrum project should have been handled um, and a Spectrum product should be. And um, I think they've got it right and I think that they will mass produce this. Maybe not in massive quantities, but certainly beyond the 4,000 four to 6,000 I think boards that are intended to be made on the back of the kickstarter so yeah that's my opinion um i'll certainly have mine um if anybody's interested by the way if it's a while before they do or they decide they don't want to mass produce um i will actually be selling this next it's going to be offered first of all back to the guy who sold it to me because that was my promise to him for him giving me at a good price and um if he decides that he doesn't want it back, once I get my proper next, um, I will fully update this one and I will be selling this one on. So anybody who wants, who hasn't got the skills to mess about with a bare board, there's going to be a fair few boards out there if you've already got an eBay, and want a complete next system, for all intents and purposes, that's exactly what this is. And if you want to play Spectrum Next games, you want, you want a next to use for yourself, I will be selling this one when my full, complete personalised laser etch system arrives so uh, bear that in mind and if you are looking for one and you see what everybody else is doing with theirs when they're finally released and you want a next
give me a shout and we'll see what we can work out. I'm always interested in trades. I'm a big hardware collector myself. Obviously, you can see in the, in the background there, I've still got my GX4000 out from the video I did a couple of days ago. Uh, oh, and just a quick reminder, anybody who watched that, a lot of people are now saying, I want to get an Amstrad GX4000. I want to get one. I want to get one of these flash carts, right? I'm going to stress this again. If you do, but do not even attempt to power that thing up until you buy the aftermarket power supply. The, the original power supply is responsible for killing a load of these consoles and you cannot use the C4 CPC flash cart without the upgraded power supply. So just a reminder there to people to get the upgraded power supply before you do anything else. You'll find the links to it. If you do some research on the C4 CPC, there's loads of big, you know, bold lettered posts about it. Um, get the upgraded power supply else it's going to be a, a, a non-starter for you. You're probably going to kill the system and you don't want to do that. So anyway, going back to the next, um, I'm going to have a quick look through the menu and see if there's any other games which you know may or may not work. This may cut off, my battery's probably a little bit low, but I'm going to just try a couple more things and just show you what a difference the, uh, the speed makes to those games, playing them uh, at the accelerated next speeds. So go back to browser. Let's go down to games. Again, I apologise if this is a bit shaky. My left hand doesn't work very well at all. Um, my foot's starting to hurt now as well, the way I'm sat, so I'm going to have to go and rest that up in a minute. Um, let's have a look, see. I'm trying to think of any games that use that kind of line drawn. In fact, wasn't the Battle Zone on the Spectrum? Because if there was, I think Battle Zone will show the speed difference. Uh quite drastically so uh, Batty, Batman Behind Closed Doors oh, no. did it go under a different name on the Spectrum? No problem Mike no problem, I'm sorry it was a bit long and convoluted but it's something I wanted to touch on in my last couple of videos and you know I'd never really got a chance to, to say it to camera so I'm just kind of saying what, you know, what people are doing how you doing Adrian, thanks for joining my stream hopefully you're watching this just covering a few nuances of the next and I've given another plug to yourself just there, my friend. You can see I've got your your first prime examples of next gaming there on the table to show people in a slightly better video than the one I did before. It's a bit steadier because I'm using my gimbal. Can't wait. For anybody who's, who's watching this, by the way, Adrian's watching this. Adrian kindly sent a demo version and some, some copies of Dungeonette to give away at Revival this year. So some people got them before the system even kind of exists for a lot of people. And it's it's a fantastic game. I've nearly played it through. Uh, Delta Star, I haven't had a chance to try and play all the way through yet. I am getting better at it, but I've got a lot of other things on. And the third in this kind of um, premiere trilogy, I suppose, of, of, of well, it's not a trilogy, but this premiere trio of games from uh, Software Amusements is going to be uh, Montana Mike, is it, I think, Adrian? Uh, which is a kind of cool um, uh, flip screen platforming game in a kind of Indiana Jones style. Anybody who's playing something like Rick Dangerous in the past will know what it's about. And you can follow the development of that on the Spectrum Next group at the moment. And as soon as that becomes available in the coming months, I'll certainly be picking it up. Uh, and obviously getting the physical copy because you've got to start a collection and um, these games are they are stellar examples of what the Spectrum Next can do and what the whole ethos is these games, in fact while, while I've got Adrian on and while I've got your attention I might as well show you some of these games because I mean the Spectrum Next Jetpack S1 oh that's Baggers in Space Roger that's coming from Jim Bagley and uh, Michael Ware um, that's baggers in space. They're, they're refining that now. We you got to play, got to play a little bit of that at revival, and I know they had it out at another recent event. Um, but yeah, that that that's shaping up to be a fantastic game as well. <laughs> that's one way of putting it, Alan. Alan, honestly, I've got to be honest. I was never an Amstrad gamer back in the day, um, but um, you know, this is my way of getting back into Amstrad gaming. 
I've got to be honest, I'm quite impressed by what I've seen so far with the GX4000. It's not a bad little system. You know, it, okay, I had a shitty standard library, but playing 464 games on it with joypads is quite cool. So I will be going into that a bit more. That's it, Rog. Yeah, he's playing it with Jim. Yeah, it's Baggers in Space. It's, it's basically, um, I suppose, a spiritual sequel to Jetpack, which is quite cool. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that as well. Another one by them is actually on the current OS, which is Warhawk. And they've added um, joystick support to that now. So I might try it in a second. But since we've got Adrian on, I'm just going to quickly show you the kind of game that's being produced for the next. Now, in case people haven't seen it, if I can get my menu to work. So I've got a slightly dodgy keyboard here. One second. Come on up. Sometimes my up key doesn't work. I'm just going to reset it, you know. Down to 10% battery as well, so I haven't got too long. But let's just see if I can quickly show you. I'll quickly show you a couple of Adrian's games here. These are proper... These obviously are not normal Spectrum games. These are proper next games. And like I say, the style of them... And this is what I like. They might be more advanced graphically. They might be more advanced in terms of sound... And they might be using things like hardware sprites, but the feel and the sound effects and the way the games, I don't know, the way the games play, they are Spectrum-esque. And that's the kind of games we want to see on this. You don't, I mean, people were worried about feeling and looking too much like an Atari ST. Okay, the quality is about there of an ST and Amiga, but the feel is still very Spectrum-ish. And you'll see when I go to... Right, we'll start with Dungeonet. This is the first release. This is the first boxed commercial release of uh, Spectrum Next game, and it's an awesome one, I'll say. This is Dungeonet. I mean, that AI music's awesome. The way it's presented is like a console game. No stupid menus and configuration like you used to have. It's just see for credits, base to start. It doesn't say on there, but it's actually Kempston joystick configured, so. Pressing fire should also start that. Although I think I've got to, now with the latest firmware, I think I've got it in the wrong port. Sorry about that. Well, I'll call it up with the keyboard anyway. And there we go. I'm not sure what the controls are. Probably QALP. And you can see that even in this more modern graphical style, it's still very much got that spectrum feel. Obviously, the inspiration for this is Attic Attack. Everybody knows that game. And I think it's space to throw your swords. There you go. So this is this is the kind of game you're looking at people producing for the next. I mean, they're so much more advanced. And they will get better over time as well. You know, this is just, my, just a big graphical improvement. You know, I'm sure the games will become more complex now we've got the ability to do so. But as long as they stay in this spectrum uh, aesthetic, I suppose, I think people will continue to want warm to them. Uh, I'm going to die here because I'm trying to play it one-handed on the keyboard. <laughs> Honestly, Rod, Dungeonette's a brilliant game. If you didn't get a chance to play it at uh, Revival, I'll have it out at the next one anyway. And hopefully by then we'll, we'll all have our systems anyway. If we haven't got them by Christmas, I'd be surprised. I'd love to get them by Christmas because if we've got it in time for the next Revival Mini, I'll definitely have these out. So that's Dungeonette. And the other one that I've got on here, which is uh, is Delta Star Earth Defence. And again, it, I've probably got the joystick in the wrong port for this. I'm not sure how the Kempston was mapped on that game, but uh, the new, the new um, firmware release for this means that... Um, it's slightly different, and obviously Adrian released these games before the final spec of the software was out, so I might need to just change that up. Uh, Dot Star Earth Defense, that's what I wanted. And in we go. And here's Delta Star Earth Defense. Roger, honestly, mate, well, I've just, I've just mentioned on here, if, if, if they don't mass produce them, and they don't, or they don't immediately mass produce them, as soon as I get mine, I'm going to be selling this next, and it's complete, you know, it's fully working. 
you know so if you do want a, a next there's going to be an option on this one uh, when I get mine Jay joystick on off I've pressed that but no I've got the wrong map to the wrong Kempston or something <laughs> trying to tap Jim for one good luck with that one mate <laughs> But like I say, if, if he doesn't, mate, there's an option here on one. So, you know, bear that in mind. So, yeah, so this is Delta Star Earth Defense by um, Software Amusements or Spectrum Next Games, however Adrian which wishes to represent himself. They're both him. But I think he's branched out from Software Amusements to push the Spectrum Next Games kind of label in advance of many more titles coming out. And you can see this is a kind of Gallagher-esque space shooter, but he's, he's utilising some pretty cool scaling and zooming effects for the enemies. The AI is still pretty basic on this game, and it's, but it is a tricky one to play, and it's a very cool one, and I'm hoping pretty soon this, this will be followed by Montana Mike, and um, we'll all get to see get this complete trio in our collections. And I'm hoping, uh, any next developers who, who might be watching this, I hope that everybody uh, maybe just contacts Adrian. You know, you're all friends now. It's not competitive like it used to be. Drop Adrian a line, and I recommend, I mean, this is a very nice way to package the games. And seeing as though his games were the first, and they've been done very well, I think this should set the standard for how Spectrum Next games should be presented. It's basically a... Um, I think it's a PSP uh, case, so it's like a DVD case pr um, depth, but obviously about two thirds of the size. Uh, I like the way it's presented and labelled. You know, it looks like an old cassette game would you know would have been. Uh, you've got nicely labelled spine, clearly marked as Sinclair ZX Spectrum next on there, and then you've got your SD card inside, and and, and quite nicely. Um, Adrian's gone with uh, blue SD cards for his games, but they're nicely labelled and everything. Quite cool. I think that all creators of games should... Um, yeah. Oh, that's it, PS Vita. Sorry, Alan. Yeah, P PS Vita, not PlayStation. PSP. Um, and I think that all creators of games should follow Adrian's example here and, and make their games packaged in a similar way because... It keeps it nice and uniform and it sets a standard. And I think that that's what, to be taken seriously as a platform and as, as a gaming system, it's nice to keep things to a standard. So I think if other developers follow this standard, it will make people have a nice uniform collection on, them, on their shelves. Uh, now, actually, Derek, the, the Spectrum Next, if you've not been following it, everything runs from SD card. The, the operating system and everything... And it's kind of hard drive is all done on an SD card. You can replace that with a self-booting game like this and start it up and it will load straight into the game. Um, you can copy tape files to SD and play the tape files on here. Um, um, but it has got the interface port at the back and the mic in here. You can do tape loading on here if you want to. And people have managed to source brand new tape decks that will work with this. If you want to load your own your old tapes and even new ones made that way, although I can't, I can see the amount of data that the uh, the next games will be. Tape loading would probably be a, a bit too much for the amount of data that's got to be loaded in. But yes, you can use the next like the old Spectrum. The interface port at the back means you can use your joystick interfaces. You can even use the the flash devices that were created for. The, the Spectrum family, like the, uh, the the Divide and Div MMC and things like that, uh, using the interface port at the back. Exactly, Alan. If there's one thing I don't miss about the old computers, this is something I've talked about before. Um, the old computers, you know, as much as I love being nostalgic, you know, I'm part of nostalgia, doing things the way we used to, the one thing I do not miss, absolutely do not miss about the old systems is tape loading. Tape loading was a necessary evil, you know. The other countries got uh, disk drives as standard because, you know, Britain was poor back in the day. Tape loading became the standard. It was cheap to create the games. It was cheap to create the decks. 
but the, the speeds and, and how slow they were, you know, I didn't even realise that disc drives even existed back in the day. And, you know, they, they weren't much faster, but they were certainly faster than tape loading. And the problems that you got with tape loading, I think it's, it's, it's a part of history we're glad to see the back of. You know, it's archaic. I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the fact we can still play those files and that the so simplistic we're still able to reproduce, you know, those effects if we want to. But low times, you know, okay, it created an atmosphere where you were forced to enjoy a game more because you'd have to sit through and wait for it to load and things like that. Um, but it also got in the way of the gameplay, especially on games that were multi-load affairs, you know, things like Outrun, uh, Indiana Jones, Wonder Boy, you know, those arcade conversions by US Gold were all multi-load affairs and it was a pain in the arse and it's something I think most people will be glad to see the back of. It's interesting that they've uh, they've incorporated it into the next and I think that's really cool but it's one aspect of retro gaming I'm personally glad to see the back of and, you know, I think it's one thing that we, we gladly did away with over time, you know, and to go back, it's one part of nostalgia I can't be doing with. Not everyone agrees with me on the subject of like um, things like flashcards. Yeah, um, a lot of people swear against them. They say it's not authentic enough. But I personally am an advocate of flashcards because you're still using the original systems as they were built. So the way the game is created from the ROM and displayed on your screen and played is identical to that of the old games. But I'm a big advocate of flashcards because it does save the convenience. It does give you so much more convenience that is needed in, in not having to change carts and store loads of carts and pay the ridiculous prices for carts um so but i under i also understand that people you know swapping a cart occasionally isn't a big deal and i can understand that but tape loading yeah tape loading the only thing that yeah as alan's just pointed out the only thing that's missing from the tape loading experience that we will miss is, is tape loading screens however as you just saw from some of the games i was loading on here the tape loading screen is still present once the game loads because the tape loading screen was often used as the title screen for the game. So the title screen is, is still present. The loading screen is still present. <coughs> exactly, Derek. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to the home computers, the load times and the unreliability of the media is something that frustrates people and frustrates a lot of collectors who can't be bothered to go down that road. And I'm 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 on the same school of thought. I I don't like tape loading. I don't even like discs. Well, at the end of the day, Rog, I've you've still got poked ROMs on here. You can use I think there's inbuilt hex editors, so you can actually poke the ROMs uh, directly on here. So you, you don't need to be able to do. It. You can still you can still launch the basic command and do pokes manually, and you can you can edit the code yourself if you want to if you want to change the game. You know and um you know insert cheats and things like that so it's still possible even with this so you know it does the the, the whole tape loading thing is uh, it's a moot point at this point there's not it's going to take a lot to convince me that tape loading was a good thing or it's something that we can miss <laughs> so anyway yeah tape loading was a, a lost cause so anyway just um quickly going back because my battery's about to run out of bound and my foot's killing me so i'm gonna have to go and put something on it yeah, the Spectrum Next, I mean, it's, it's it's shaping up to be an awesome... I mean, it's already an awesome system anyway, but it's shaping up to be something really special. I like the changes that are being made to the interface, to the, the firmware and everything, and I think it's it's going to be an awesome full-release system. When it's fully packaged, you know, it's going to be like Christmas Day all over again. Christmas Day 1984 for me, when the Spectrum Next, when the Spectrum Next arrives, I think it's going to be an awesome system. And I think it's something that should go into be mass produced, and it should be something that everybody who's um denied about getting one. I re whether you're a, a Spectrum fanboy, Commodore fanboy, or anything like that, it's the first new old system to be released that I take seriously as a system, and it will become my go-to Spectrum because it does everything that my old Spectrums do. It recreates it all faithfully on screen. The interface and everything is all very familiar. It doesn't feel like emulation. Uh, it's a hard thing to describe. It doesn't feel like using an emulator. It's a real system. And, you know, the FPGA thing kind of reinforces that thought, you know. And I think that the Spectrum Next as a complete system is going to be something ev every retro gamer and every retro enthusiast is going to want to get on board with. And, um, yeah, pretty soon 
uh, I'll be covering more games on here and um, pretty soon I'll be um, you know demonstrating a bit more as the features get enhanced so so anyway the spectrum next that was some of the enhanced uh, next accelerated features accelerated gaming and uh, I hope you're all looking forward to getting your next and if you haven't had, had one I hope you're inspired into getting one because it's a cool system and I hope you like my video by the way I'm trying to do a bit more with this and uh, I'd appreciate if you all gave my video a like dropped a few extra comments and um, pretty soon I'll be throwing in a couple of extra new videos I've got some great hardware coming in soon and I'll be covering that in, in a bit more detail so I'll see you all soon